Hi, everybody. Apologies. We're getting off to a bit of a late start. I realize we're having some technical issues here. So um, we'll just give it one second so everyone can file in and then we'll get started. Um, good. Looks like a number of folks are joining. Give it a couple more seconds. And you'll notice that you're all currently uh, not on screen and muted. That's just to help improve our sound quality and make sure we can hear from our panelists. All right. So it looks like everybody's in for now. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, just welcome everybody to this webinar. And we're going to be exploring the 2023 findings of the Corporate Human Rights Benchmarks, a uh, benchmark of the uh, apparel and extractive sectors. We're really pleased to have a great lineup of speakers today. Um, we're going to be hearing first off from Talia Suisa, who's the Engagement Manager at the World Benchmarking Alliance. Then we will hopefully be hearing from Iram Hashmat, um, who is Senior Expert for Social Responsibility and Human Rights at the OMB Aktien Gesellschaft. Then we'll hear from Vaidhi Sakdef, uh, social lead in the sustainable outcomes team at Aviva Investors, and then Maggie Kettis, active ownership director for responsible investment at Nordia Asset Management. Um, currently, uh, Iram and Maggie are uh, working out some issues with regards to logging on, but uh, they should be here in a second. Um, I'm really pleased to be having the opportunity to uh, hold this webinar today with our speakers because we have been working now for some time with the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark in terms of using the valuable data that they're offering on five high-risk sectors to help um, shape investors' engagements with companies who have a very poor performance, uh, unfortunately, on uh, human rights, in particular with regards to their human rights due diligence processes. And this year marks now for a number of the sectors, the fifth year of being benchmarked. Uh, and that's true for, I believe, both extractives and apparel. So we'll have a chance today to kind of see not only the results from this year, but also to uh, understand better how companies have done over time. Um, so I think that's going to be some important information, which will help also shape uh, the engagements that investors are doing with this set of companies. Um, so without further ado, and realizing we've gotten off to a bit of a late start, I'm going to hand it over to Talia. And Talia, I'm gonna share my screen here and you just prompt me and let me know uh, when I should be moving forward with regards to the slides. So Thanks, let's Rebecca, just make sure. Andrew. Okay, can you see that? Can everyone see those? Yeah, but I think it's better if you go into full screen mode. Got it. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah. So let me just start off by saying that um, it's been a month since I'm back from maternity leave, and I've been really looking forward to this webinar and to reconnecting with some of you that I've been in touch with uh, before going on mat leave. So just very happy to be here. Uh, for the sake of time, let's dive right into it. If we can go to the first slide, Rebecca. I can hear Talia. I'm having a little bit of an issue. This is this is tech issue day today, unfortunately. Hold on a sec. Let me stop sharing and try to reshare again. I may have to, for whatever reason, do it without the full screen. But let me just see here one more time. Yeah, I can. I can probably start. Just kind of the first slide is really an introduction, so I can probably start uh, presenting without a visual here. Um, so just to say, I think Rebecca said some of this, but this year we're pub we published the fifth iteration of the CHRB for the extractives and apparel sectors. We assessed 110 companies uh, from these sectors. And a reminder that last year we assessed three other sectors, food and agricultural products, ICT manufacturing, and automotive manufacturing. Um, so this is just kind of a slide showing the different sectors um, that I had ready, uh, but I'm not sure we need it. Um, yeah, there is we go. Is that working now? Okay, yeah. so I can't go full screen, but I'm hoping that people can still see the full slide. Is that working? I think that should be fine. Yeah, great. Um, and here I'm not gonna go into detail on the benchmarking cycle, but I want to reiterate that company engagement is embedded in our um, benchmarking process. This means that every company that is assessed has an opportunity to review its draft assessment, to provide feedback, to schedule an engagement call with us. Um, and this year we had a company engagement rate of over 50%. Can go over to the next one. Great, so with that in mind, I'll dive right into our key findings from this year. 
Um, so let's start with some good news. Um, some companies show that transformative change is possible within five years. Um, so after five CTRB assessments, most apparel and extractive companies are making progress with 70% having improved their score since 2018 on key human rights indicators, uh, which include policy commitment, human rights due diligence, and grievance mechanisms. And we have a group of 12 companies uh, that improved their score by five times the average and improved their uh, sector ranking by over 10 places. Um, the list of the companies is available in our insights report that I will share after the presentation. But just to note that OMV that is here is one of those companies that um, improved their uh, sector ranking by over 10 places uh, in this iteration. Um, so what are these companies doing differently? Um, all of them allocate senior responsibility for day-to-day -day management of human rights issues, which is similar to the findings we had last year. So it's really in line and we see that this is a cross-sectoral issue. Um, and then we also see that these companies assess their salient human rights uh, risks and impacts. We see that they have built internal capacity and provided human rights trainings. And we also see that the majority of them have uh, grievance mechanisms for external stakeholders. Can move to the next one, please. Yeah, so the second key finding, um, we know that by now in their fifth iteration being assessed, the majority of companies have a policy commitment to respect human rights. However, we wanted to see what moved companies from commitment to action. We're always trying to find these indicators. Um, and we saw the two practices are correlated with better performance on the benchmark. So the first is that companies disclosing how they assign day-to-day -day responsibility um, for human rights across different departments. Uh, this is one of the indicators that we saw that is correlated with better performance on the benchmark and only 50% of companies are doing that. And the second is providing targeted human rights trainings to managers and workers and 39% of companies are doing that. So these two practices appear key for progress um, as companies that do both of these outperform their peers by 150% on the benchmark. Um, we can move to the third key finding, please. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so our third key finding is on stakeholder engagement in human rights due diligence. So first, we do see overall improvement on human rights due diligence. So we see that 61% of extractive and apparel companies demonstrate that they're taking one or more uh, human rights due diligence steps uh, compared to only 51 in uh, 2018. However, just above a quarter of companies disclose evidence of engaging with stakeholders throughout this process. Uh, so this means that more than half of the, uh, of the companies of the human rights due diligence processes we assessed um, did not include disclosure of consultation with rights holders, uh, which questions the fairness and efficiency of this process um, altogether really. Um, we can move to our fourth key finding. Thank you. Uh, so the next key finding is on the quality of companies' grievance mechanisms. So we see that by now the vast majority of companies uh, provide access to grievance mechanisms. However, we see that most fail to ensure that there is meaningful participation of rights uh, right holders. Um, so only 5% of companies provide uh, predictability and transparency regarding procedures timelines and outcomes, and 10% ensure uh, ownership by involving users in the design of the mechanism. So we have to move away from only looking at whether workers have access to grievance mechanism and start looking at the quality of these mechanisms. How are they created? Um, how are complaints being handled? Um, are timelines communicated to workers? Um, or is it just a black hole of uncertainty with no clear outcomes, you just file a complaint and you have no idea when the procedure will take place. So these are the questions that we uh, should be asking. Um, if we can move to the fifth key finding. So the last key finding is on expectations versus actions uh, in the supply chain. Um, this key finding is focused on the apparel companies benchmark, um, also in our gender benchmark. Um, and it combines finding from both the gender benchmark and the CHRB. 
So we see that the majority of companies place gender or and or human rights expectations on their suppliers, but only half of companies actually support their suppliers on at least one human rights or gender topic. For reference, when I say support suppliers, it can mean working with them on a given human rights topic by providing uh, trainings, capacity building, um, among other things. Um, in addition, we see that only about a quarter of companies have responsible purchasing practices in place that allow their suppliers to meet human rights expectations, so such as avoiding short notice requests and delayed uh, payments. So again, the point here is that companies should move from placing expectations on suppliers to actions and capacity building, uh, working with the suppliers on these issues. Um, I'll move to the next slide, please. So now we went over our key findings and I'd like to mention that this year we've added recommendations for investors on the topics and type of questions they could ask companies during their engagements. This is, of course, in addition to the individual company scorecards that are available uh, for you to use in your engagements. Um, so in our insights report, we have these in boxes next to the key findings, uh, but I summarize some of the issues here. So first, in engagement with companies that are at the very beginning of their human rights journey, you can emphasize the importance of internal resources. So very basic questions. How do you resource human rights? Uh, do you have dedicate, a dedicated team? How many full-time employees work on human rights? So these very kind of basic resource questions, um, as well as responsibility allocation in the company and trainings on human rights. So those are two other topics that are um, important to ask companies uh, about. Another question you can ask companies is whether their grievance mechanisms are open to all workers, including supply chain workers, as well as questions related to the quality of their grievance mechanism. So this is linked to the key finding I mentioned earlier, some questions on uh, basically how did you design the grievance mechanism? Did you involve stakeholders? Are timelines communicated to users? Um, another question you can ask companies is how uh, responsibility for implementing uh, their human rights policy commitment is disseminated beyond uh, senior management level. Um, so we see in the benchmark that clear allocation of day-to-day -day responsibility can help company move from policies to practices more uh, effectively, especially when this is combined with training uh, tailored to the employee's uh, role. And another question uh, that is essential, and I think it links to the other one, is asking companies how they ensure their grievance mechanism facilitates the involvement of rights holders in all stages in the creation of the mechanism itself, but also when they are treating uh, complaints uh, filed. Um, I'll move to the next slide, please. So this was supposed to be a slide that I press and the different things appear and it was supposed to look much nicer, but I'll just read it out loud um, as we had some technical issues. Um, so I just like to highlight the resources that are available when we publish a benchmark. So for those of you that are familiar with the CHRB and WBA, you probably know this, but for the newcomers, when we publish a benchmark, we also publish an insights report with our key findings and sector specific findings, um, company rankings on the benchmark, individual company scorecards with all of the underlying data that we use for the assessment, we also published a detailed um, downloadable data sheet that allows you to compare company performance on an indicator level, and you can filter out the sectors, compare certain topics. Um, so you can really play with that data sheet, and it's very useful for a lot of our stakeholders. And we also um, publish, we always have our uh, sector teacher B methodologies. So our methodology is a public good. It's publicly available and it aligns with international standards such as the UNGPs, OECD guidelines, as well as sector specific standards. I'll go to the last slide, please. So what, what's next for the CHRB? So 2024 will, in 2024, we will be focusing on further analysis of the five years of data gathered uh, to provide deeper insights into progress on business and human rights more generally. We will hold consultations with stakeholders, um, offering various feedback opportunities uh, throughout the year. 
and uh, we want your input. So we want to know how you've been uh, using the CHRB in your work uh, through updating the tracker that Rebecca and uh, Asaba created or by reaching out to us, sharing uh, specific examples that you have of how you've used the, uh, the data in your work and our benchmarks in your work. Um, I'd also like to note that we work with stakeholders in different ways uh, in the social transformation team in WBA. So we have our collective impact coalition that some of you are a part of. I won't go over that right now. Uh, we have our communities of practice for companies where good practices, examples uh, from our benchmarks are used to facilitate peer learnings. Um, and maybe last thing to mention, but not least, uh, we'll be publishing our social benchmark next year. So we'll be assessing 2000 companies on a set of 12 indicators focused on ethical conduct, decent work and human rights. And the human rights indicators also include the first three steps of a human rights due diligence process. So I'll stop here, I'll hand it back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Talia, that was really tremendous. And it's great to have this data, you know, and I have to say it's, it's also, uh, really good to see that you have those kind of questions already integrated that investors can ask their companies, depending on where those companies are in the journey. And and uh, good to see also that there's some clear leading indicators that have emerged with regards to clearly assigned responsibilities within companies. You know, I think that's that's, that's, that's an important indicator for sure. Um, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to a QA and a in here in a second. Um, folks, I see maybe already have some questions. Feel free to put your questions um, here in uh, the chat function, and we'll get to those then in a little bit. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to first hand it over to Vaidehi Sakdev um, with Aviva Investors. Aviva has been one of the investors who has been really playing a leadership role from the outset with regards to setting up, you know, the, the corporate human rights benchmark within the World Benchmarking Alliance, but also in terms of leading um, a, a larger group of investors who, as I said, have been engaging with a number of companies that have lagged behind on their human rights performance for uh, some time now, although some of them also showing some decisive progress, as we've seen as well from Talia's, um, uh, the data that Talia has shared. So, Vadi, I'm going to go, go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks for being here today. Thank you so much, Rebecca and, and Talia. Um, and I suppose I'm just going to reflect a little bit on some of our experiences of engaging with companies using the CHRB data, um, where we've seen some, some useful progress, um, but also where we still see um, areas or, or room for improvement. Um, and just reflecting on what has been an interesting five years of evolution of, of, of the CHRB. So, um, I mean, one of the first um, and most obvious observations to make is that, you know, the CHRB was set up at quite, in quite a different context to the one that we find ourselves in now, where voluntary standards were the primary way, not the only way, but certainly one of the main ways to drive corporate behavior change. And companies were also m much further behind than they than they are now. Um, now that context is, is quite different. Obviously, we have a number of mandatory laws that have been introduced in multiple countries and certain companies, um, not all, have made quite a bit of progress, um, e even though we see a, a large cohort still lagging behind. So I think what we've noticed, and, and certainly from talking to peers um, using the CHRB data and being part of the um, collaborative engagement, has seen that we've 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 almost sort of moved away from the CHRB being almost the exclusive um, focus of our dialogues with companies to CHRB becoming part of a wider dialogue with companies on their management of human rights risks and impacts. And I think that speaks to the changing language, but also to the maturity of the topic that we're seeing on the part of investors, but also companies that we speak um, with. And I think something that um, CHRB and, and obviously those those close to it will, will reflect on next year is just what kind of roles can CHRB play in this changing context? Um, and I'm, I'm sure that will be part of the, the 2024 review. Um, something else that we've observed um, that we think is also really key um, to engagement with um, companies, particularly those that lag um, behind on the HRDD indicators, is the importance and need um, of persistence. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is where we've we've noticed that there has been often um, at times a need to just repeat asks that we have 
of uh, specific individuals within companies over the course of several meetings. And I'm thinking in particular of, of a, a couple of companies that we've engaged with, um, and I'm sure colleagues on the call, um, Lorraine and, and Nicole, um, that have been part of the Broadcom engagement, but there have been others, where it's almost taken just a couple of years to even get to a point where you can have a substantive conversation on, for instance, um, the topic of a human rights impact assessment. There, there, there sometimes seems to be a need to, to repeat the ask and really get under the skin of what a company is suggesting that it's um, done or claiming. Um, and as investors, that can be um, sometimes quite a, a challenging, uncomfortable um, conversation to have, but really I think that comes down and it is possible because we've seen investors become extremely well versed in in this topic and are kind of catching companies out when they claim that they've done x y and z but in reality that's not the case um i think that persistence does mean that we spend a lot of time as investors um committing resources to individual companies in ways that might not necessarily be that resource efficient so i think there are ways that we might need to think about how we can bring cohorts of companies that need that kind of dedicated training up to speed to understand what HRDD is and what the CHRB methodology requires because sometimes I think as investors we can almost feel like a bit of a consultancy service and that's probably something that we want to um, move away from. The other kind of couple of points I'd make is that collaboration has been really critical um, in um, the, the Investor Alliance collaboration. Um, speaking from the perspective of a UK asset manager, we are often small investors, sometimes quite um, with passive holdings in some of these laggard companies that um, are based in EM countries. And so it can be difficult to apply our leverage um, and to build relationships with, with companies. Um, so that, that's where partnering with other investors can be really helpful. I think in, in the future, we might want to see some more of that targeted pockets of engagements in different markets with other investors that have those relationships. And then finally, I'll just say Talia um, uh, and the team have been uh, a super resource for us, particularly when we've needed more detail behind a scorecard um, to inform our engagements, but also to be able to direct companies to the CHRB to give them that grounding and training on um, what HIDD involves. And so I think th that's been a really helpful thing for us to be able to refer companies um, to. Um, and I'll probably stop there because I'm sure we've got lots of other interesting points to hear. Thank you, Vidi. That is really great to have that perspective. I mean, you've definitely been at this for some time. So, you know, it's, it's good to kind of hear what you've seen change over time and, and where we still need to go. Um, I'm just looking here to see, um, we did have some technical issues, as I was saying, to see if we can, um, if potentially Iram Hashmet, who was going to join us from OMV, is in the uh, participant list, um, but I don't see Asaba or Anita. Do we have Iram or Maggie and potentially online as participants oh. that we can elevate them? No, they're not. Um, I, Maggie's, there's, I, I think the internet is down for her, both in her oh. home and at the office. She's trying to dial in. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh. And Iram's saying she is here. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Ah, I wonder if you're, uh, you know what? I think it's forget to Bickler. As, yeah, she said it's forget to Bickler. Yes, that's that's right. why. So, All right. Okay, yeah. Looks like so it's let's working. See. Let me, okay. I've done it. I've promoted her to panelists. So let's see. Okay. Um, okay. So she's in as a panelist now, Iram. And it looks um, like she's connecting to audio. Um, Iram, can you say something so, yeah. so we can hear you? Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. Yes. Okay. So I will say, do not be deceived. Brigitte is actually not. <laughs> Brigitte, okay. it's Iram, who's with us from OMV. Um, I'm Thank glad you, we got this to work out. This seems to be the day of technological issues for some unknown reason. Had to happen at some point, I guess. <laughs> but Thank I'm going to hand it over to you then. Thanks for okay. joining us. Thanks. I was trying to connect and then Brigitte Bickler, she sent me her link to use and then I tried and it somehow it worked. So th then I changed my name from Bickler to Iram and I was able to join, but it was... So you were able to see Brigitte Bickler instead of Aram. Yeah, I was we're trying seeing. since like, you know, quarter to four, I started trying, but I don't know. I was not well, able to find the web page 
Well, well, no people. worries. It's you're you're here now, and we've got you know the yeah. audience here ready to 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 hear what you'd like to share with us with regards to the journey that OMV has been on with regards to um you know learning from its its the data that the CHRB team has assessed it on, and and would love to hear more about that journey. Can you see my video? Let me open my video as well because no, you we can't, can't unfortunately. Ah, oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. So, um, uh, shall yeah. I start? Yes, please do. Please do. Okay. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. I've been working since 2019 closely with CHRB, trying to improve our performance as per the requirements CHRB has uh, mentioned in the methodology. So um, I'm with OMV for the last many, many years, and I was the first employee in OMV globally who was responsible for community relations and community investment. So that was like first full-time employee OMV hired in 20, 2004. So since then, I've been working with OMV at different locations. And now I'm working with the global office, uh, corporate office, working with a team of uh, sustainability and Brigitte Bigler is head of sustainability. So me and my colleague, Francisca Richter, we both are looking after the topic of human rights as a senior expert for uh, OMB group organizations. And then we have rest of the organization, which I will explain in my further talk. Uh, how did we, um, how our journey went through since 2019? I have categorized after reviewing our scoring, what I have categorized or grouped, there were five points which I would uh, like to highlight. Uh, where we feel that we really made efforts to improve. The first one is about that we not only uh, improved our disclosure of the data publicly, but also enhanced some of our policy commitments and responsibilities. So this is one area where we really worked hard to disclose most of the information on our website or in our reporting. So we tried to make more details in reporting. So that was one area which has really helped us in improving our scoring so that, you know, you can, your analyst, CHRB analyst can review the data which is available on uh, publicly on our website or on our sustainability report. The second point where we really made effort was about raised a lot of awareness among our employees, our business partners, our shareholding companies, and also with the government officials we are working with, especially, you know, in high risk countries like Tunisia or Libya, where you really where operating companies are government subsidiaries and you really need to make a lot of effort and push to the government's organizations to understand the commitments and responsibilities OMB has in its um, on its shoulder. Then the third category which we have worked on was about the increased effort on our due diligence process. This is one of the key area I'm personally looking after, uh, not only the due diligence on our operational side, but also with our op uh, operating companies and also shareholding companies. And with reference to shareholding companies, we are now arranging exchange programs, building their capacities, uh, arranging different capacity building sessions with them at various levels, not only at the leadership level, but also at the mid-management level or closely working with those responsible for the human rights topic in the in the organization. So that was the third area where we really were working hard. We are still struggling with the suppliers, but I'll give you some examples for that. The fourth area where we have enhanced our effort was the grievance management system, especially for our employees and for uh, contractor employees and communities. For communities, the grievance management, what we have done is that we have made it mandatory that all our operations should have the community grievance management system as per UNGP criteria. So this is, this is one of the key area that we are trying to improve the overall management system of the grievances. Although like we are lagging behind in terms of stakeholder engagement for grievance management, for handling the grievance management, but still we are struggling with that. And the fifth area, which I would, with the most important one, which I would like to highlight is about the governance topic. 
that how did we improve our organization for uh, managing or for addressing the risk assessment for human rights topic within the whole organization starting from the leadership that uh, since 2022 we have uh, our ceo has taken the responsibility as a owner and we have been now in direct uh, reporting to the ceo not only to the ceo but we as an organization we are reporting to the cfo which is the uh, chief financial officer as a board member but the owner of the human rights topic is our executive board member and uh, the chief executive officer so we are by annually briefing him and we are also raising you know if there is uh, an issue which is which need to be escalated we are escalating as a critical sustainability concern to our sustainability transformation committee to our supervisory board and to the ceo so there are different levels where we are um, like critically highlighting the issue if any human right grievance or human right violations we have observed to, uh, within the the oav group wide so these are the five areas so i'll start with the the first topic about the uh, policy commitment and responsibilities here we have uh, in 2022 we have updated and elaborated our human rights policy commitments that policy document is published on our website and at the same time we have raised a uh, capacity building program for our employees so that they are fully aware not only aware about our commitments but also need to understand the responsibilities each employee has concerning the human rights topic for this we have uh, three different platforms we have created the first one is about the online platform which is the e learning this e learning content wise we have elaborated more in terms of commitment and responsibilities so that uh, employee each employee it is mandatory for each employee to go through this e learning tool so this is a kpi for external reporting as well for uh, until 2030 that we want all our employees fully trained and fully aware about their responsibilities and commitments so this is a mandatory e learning training then the second part is that in the countries where uh, with high human rights risk areas we are doing the in person human rights training so that is also counted so that you know if for the middle management and for all employees in that country the third which uh, the initiative which we have uh, initiated in 2023 this is the human rights learning path we uh, our people and culture department has created a online platform for sustainability learning path so all focal for areas including human rights they have their own learning uh, training series on different topics within human rights like human rights due diligence like human rights with stakeholder engagement human rights grievance management system so this these are different series of trainings and employees can register uh, for these webinars and for these uh, uh, online trainings and it's a one or two hours training where uh, that whoever is interested they can join so these are the three different platforms which we have adopted for raising more awareness and building capacity of our employees on human rights topic then i have already mentioned about the ceo ownership so we are now we have now started the biannual briefing not only to the ceo but also to the sustainability transformation committee and to the cfo who is uh, where sustainability and human rights topic is directly organizationally in direct reporting so these are the three different channels where we have started the reporting at the leadership level but at the same time you know our business heads in at the business level or site level they are accountable for fulfilling the human right responsibilities but the roles and responsibilities for the implementation level were a bit vague not were not very clear so we have identified and clarified all the roles and responsibilities at business sides that the focal points for human rights this has been also declared that within the hscc department or wherever the, in the organization uh, community relations teams are working or uh, social investment is working we are preferring to have a focal point for human rights so this has also been declared over there 
Then at the same time, this is the organization we are working. And after that, uh, we are talking about the, the training platform. I have already explained it to you. In the due diligence, um, we have increased our efforts for by including the KPI for external reporting about the human rights assessments, especially in the countries with high human rights risks. So we are doing a kind of different levels of assessment. The first activity is human rights self-assessment. So self-assessment is an exercise where we have uh, we are analyzing the answers with the help of international experts, external experts, the responses of all the managers who are responsible for their human rights responsibilities like procurement, HSCC department, security, CSR, asset management, operations. So they are all answering the questions and then all these answers are evaluated by our international experts and then they make the recommendations and we develop jointly we develop the action plan which is monitored by uh, by us in the corporate at the corporate level that the businesses are following their action plans and reporting quarterly about their performance that whatever gaps are identified and after doing this uh, human rights self-assessment exercise, after one or two years, we are moving towards the audit. So this is, you know, human rights self-assessment is a kind of preparation for the businesses to fill their gaps so that then we start with the internal and external audit as well. But at the same time, whenever we are starting um, our new business in a new country, we are doing the country entry check. Country entry check, depending on the risk level of the country, I, if it is a medium risk or low risk, we are using the Maplecraft uh, data. And if the country is at low or medium risk, we are doing the internal country entry check. But if it is a high risk country, then we involve the external stakeholder, external consultant or experts who are working on our behalf to give us the full picture of the country and what are the areas or risk areas where we have to uh, to pay attention and address the impacts. At the same time, for our community relations, we have a community relations process. In uh, It's a full-fledged handbook where all these processes are explained. And the first activity is about social and human rights impact assessment. Like in Romania, we have, you must have heard about OMV Petrom's Neptune Deep uh, Seawater Project. So we have already initiated the social and human rights impact assessment study. And this is a big study where we will we are going to address all those human rights risks and social impacts this project is going to have and how to define the measures and solutions if there is a negative potential negative impact over there, especially for the fishery community. So that's how this uh, due diligence process has been addressed and then about the grievance management channel uh, there are like we have external grievances at the operational level for communities and at all sites our community relations teams they are responsible for day-to-day -day engagement and consultation with communities and local stakeholders so they are managing the grievance channel but it's we have three different categories like social human rights and um, environmental. So the, under these three categories, they are reporting to, to the corporate office on a quarterly basis. And once we identify any human rights grievance reported, then the corporate office, we ourselves get actively involved to analyze the, the situation that if there is any human rights violation or not. At the same time, we have an email address uh, which is available to all the employees that if they have, they find and they observe any kind of human rights violation, they can directly write to us on that email address as well. But at the same time, we have hotline system for our employees as well for human rights, uh, for any kind of grievances. So different OMV organizations are handling it, like OMV Petrom, OMV uh, Group, and then OMV Sapura. And Borealis, they have their own hotline systems, which are now integrated uh, and reported directly to us, where we compile all the data and brief the, the CEO and the transformation committee. So that's how the whole process has been working. We are still struggling uh, uh, to update our code of conduct in which 
we are going we are uh, elaborating the human right responsibilities for our suppliers this is going to be finalized by end of this year or beginning or beginning of you know will be approved beginning of this year uh, next year and the new activity which we have initiated in 2023 is about the due diligence of our potential business relationships so we have different templates different checklist based on our human rights responsibilities and human rights commitments and these uh, we are checking the we are doing the compliance check of all potential business relationships and we are giving feedback to the business that what what are the gaps in order to meet into in order to comply with oeb's commitments and how uh, potential organizations can fulfill these gaps so if the there was i remember that there was an organization it was a german based organization working in oman that they had some gaps in terms of uh, reporting in terms of monitoring they had all these commitments uh, like policy commitment they had but they did not have the monitoring system for their labors that whether their subcontractors are paying the right wages or working hours so we asked we requested them to start developing the monitoring mechanism and report to us on a quarterly basis so that's how we are struggling with ours but we have our procurement department having full fledged uh, system on sustainability indicators including human rights so all our suppliers are pre are before registration they are pre qualified on human rights criteria as well and once they are registered they have to fulfill all the requirements through by signing our code of conduct and so that's how and procurement itself is doing random audits for all the um, the big suppliers and contractors with high risks so this is also an independent procurement activity so that's how we are struggling but i have noticed in chrb like scoring that still omv needs to uh, focus and elaborate its like um, reporting where i feel that there are a lot of practices especially in community relations but this is not reported as per requirement of chrb so i think you know if everything is cannot be covered and in sustainability report or on our website maybe we need to publish our own human rights report performance report so that you know which could be published at our website so that we have more opportunity in terms of explaining in detail about our performance and fulfilling our commitments so that's it from my side here. Yes, thank you. That is it was really useful and, and a really detailed perspective on, you know, a company like yours that's really gone quite far quite quickly. And um, I'm going to encourage folks to please put questions in the Q&A so that we can ask them of our speakers. Um, but before we go over, I just wanted to ask you one follow up question, Iram. So, you know, oftentimes, um, I think companies are advised to when when implementing human rights due diligence processes to build on what's already there, so to speak, right? You know, build on if you're doing talk about human rights impact assessment, build potentially on um, existing you know risk management processes that might be in place. You know, community relations. There's usually something already there in terms of how you're engaging with external stakeholders. So I'm just curious. Um, in terms of OMV, what did you already have in place that you could easily build up to this, you know, system that you just described to us? We had community relations team at business sites. That was a kind of, you know, strength of OMV at the very grassroots level, who are, are in direct contact with the the local stakeholders, including communities. I think this is the strength OMV has used. to use these community relations team members as the focal point for human rights that was one thing the second thing was that we already had the human rights management system in place but there were a lot of you know details missing in terms of contractor monitoring that was the area which was if you remember, so that was the area which was missing so it was easier for us to evaluate the procurement directives and to hcc directives and human resource directives and then find out that where are the gaps so that's how we filled those gaps and elaborated more thoroughly so that those who are responsible for implementing those directives are fully aware about it 
then we had human rights training already in place we were already arranging community relations training so we included human rights as one of the key topics in the community relations training for our employees so that's how you know different platforms which like we have service quality meetings with contractors this is a normal feature where all different multiple departments are dealing with contractors about their issues about their performance check so we have included human rights as one of the key area for to discuss the, uh, the in the service quality meetings at sites and we have also provided a detailed checklist to our site staff that within human rights you have to discuss these topics about labor rights about health and safety so that's how we are using existing platforms for highlighting the human rights and for making more like embedding or integrating the human rights topic within the existing system and so I just one more question because I know we have some questions that are coming in here but I'm just curious so given that OMV has really you know developed a you know this the system in a very elaborate fashion and you know with and and certainly touching on some of those areas that Tali has indicated are leading indicators in terms of having clear cut responsibilities within the organization the tone being set from the top you know you talked elaborate just uh, in detail about the trainings that you're having for all your employees and and the kind of um, outreach that you're doing to your suppliers are you finding ways to also share what you're doing with others um, in your sector as well? Um, you know, peer companies, you know, not necessarily be in Austria or beyond. Are there are there uh, venues that you're finding to kind of promote others to, to go this journey as uh, go down this pathway as well? Uh, yes, we have like in Libya, we have uh, initiated a discussion with an NGO uh, together with Equinor that all international companies, if we can uh, discuss together at one platform on the topic of human rights and security. So this is a kind of, you know, initiative. We have uh, requested one organization, which is a, a nonprofit organization, completely neutral. Uh, and they, so we have initiated the discussion and making a kind of platform in Libya, for Libya. So this is one. Then at the same time, yes, we have like uh, different, uh, sometimes, you know, multiple joint venture partners. We are arranging training together, like uh, uh, we had exchange program from our shareholding company, mm, the focal mm, person for human rights. She spent two weeks with us and tried to understand our processes. So sometimes, you know, we are exchanging the information as well within the, the peer companies through our own, like through IPICA. IPICA is a very good platform where, you know, all the industry representatives are there. So through there, we have our connections and sometimes individually, we are also exchanging the information and supporting each other. Because these are the topics like CSR and human rights. These are the topics where you need to share the information and you need to exchange ideas so that we can improve the performance. This is not business related information. So our peer companies are supporting each other for helping each other. Oh, interesting. Well, I'm gonna use, you drop the word security there. Oh, so go ahead, buddy. looks like you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question both to Iram and also to Talia, because you mentioned Iram, the, the, the fact that there's, there's some work that you do that isn't necessarily disclosed or disclosed in a way that can be picked up by the CHRB because it's not necessarily speaking to a specific indicator. So that might mean that you as a company will think about disclosing information in a different way, perhaps via a dedicated human rights report. So I wondered I kind of how, how common a, a, a phenomenon is that? Because we hear that from companies quite a lot, you know, that they're doing more than is being captured by the CHRB score. And so Talia to you, you know, how often do you hear that and also how are you thinking about that going forward? Um, perhaps too too early to ask, but but just in terms of how you think the methodology might evolve or not to to reflect the fact that companies have a range of practices that they are developing and conducting, but that can't necessarily always be captured by a neat methodology. Um, I think maybe that... you know, my proposal would be that maybe you know some internal documents which are like regulations or management systems where these things because policy is a two or three page document 
but in the management system you will find a lot of you know which is an which is a, a confidential document but with by signing the co, um, the confidentiality agreement chrb can access all those data all those information which is available inside the organization so this is i would say that companies should be given this opportunity because there are a lot of internal reports which cannot be published due to not having sufficient resources because how many people you will hire for documentation and how much information you will disclose publicly for example you know community grievances cases like we are doing reporting but if you want to analyze different kind of you know human rights related grievances maybe you know companies are given the opportunity to share some examples which are, are available internally and not published externally internal document does not mean that we will provide you fake information because if we are sharing the management system with you it has been signed by the management so you will see that how this system is in place within the organization at the same time there are different examples and case studies which we can share through our internal reports which are available in the organization but are not publicly available and when i was reading this report uh, like i appreciate chrb in terms of because it's a very detailed indicator and methodology and we are struggling to improve our performance it's a guiding document for us i don't see it's like uh, that we need to reach to the score but i see it as a guiding document for me the methodology because that is helping me that how to um, define my commitments in the policy document or how to improve our management system because uh, this chrb methodology is really helping us in updating our human rights management system where contractor monitoring was completely missing was not explained in detail if we are ex expecting our sites but they need something in writing to show the process that what process and procedures they need to follow but this process and this management system cannot be explained in the sustainability report so different sites have like uh, there are a lot of community consultation meeting minutes at sites all businesses have but we cannot ask them to send all this information to us this is humanly not possible for us so these are the areas where in my opinion you know chrb can look into that we are not saying that we need to create a new case study um, for your reporting but we need to have some authentic data where you can see the dates you can see um, the signatures of the management that these are the authentic internal documents which you can have a look this is my i don't want to we, we thank you Yerm. that was a very um, detailed response and I, I i'm aware of the time unfortunately we did get a little bit of a late start but we do need to end at the full hour so i want to give talia a chance to jump in as well and then there's two questions if we have time i'd like to get to talia go ahead yeah no i think by the way this is like a question that we get very often as a is a it's a benchmark we're looking only publicly available information with the idea of pushing towards transparency it doesn't mean mm -hmm. i think we are aware that we're missing uh on some information on uh, actions that companies are taking but ideally what we're trying to do is also push for transparency um and have companies publish uh, more and more information in the public domain uh we're never asking companies to publish information that might um kind of reveal private matters such as uh, specific grievance cases, but we want to see kind of high level analysis of it. Um, so yeah, we're not kind of asking companies to to break um, any um, confidentiality agreements, et cetera. Um, so yeah, this is just a note. I'll, I'll end it here. I know we're out of time. Yeah. Um, so I'll hand it yeah, back. Just, yes, thank you. And I just, I don't know if you had a chance to see the two questions, if they're both directed at you, Talia, but just maybe quick question about um, attention of uh, scrutinizing private security. I know that's definitely an indicator. Uh, there's a sub if I'm not mistaken, to that topic. Um, and then also just with regards to questions about um, how you take into account social auditing and some of its limitations and when receiving data from companies. Do you maybe something you could speak to just in 30 seconds before we so close out? Very briefly, uh, we don't have any intention of focusing on um, the private security sector as such, but as Rebecca said, we do look at 
um, security risks when it comes to specific sectors. For example, for the extractive sector, we look at it as a salient risk that is associated with the sector. So we have specific indicators that I won't discuss now, but I'm happy to share all of the information after the, the webinar. Um, and then for the second questions about auditing. So we don't give companies a kind of an automatic score, like um, a point for uh, conducting an audit. Um, we're looking at a process that a company has in place, a human rights due diligence process. So I think audits could be used to work towards improvements in some cases, but they cannot replace a human rights due diligence process. Um, so we're really looking at how companies have a uh, human rights process within the company and not necessarily how they outsource kind of a one instant audit uh, that they might uh, publish in a report. This will not um, qualify uh, for the human rights due diligence indicators um, as sufficient evidence. Um, I can go into this even more, but I'll, I'll stop here, um, Rebecca, and see well, if you want to say anything else. No, thank you. That was that was really helpful in, in terms of understanding how you deal with the social auditing issue. Um, I just want to thank our speakers. Um, you know, really tremendous, Talia, to have this new information, Vidahi, to see, understand how investors are using the CHRB data, and Iram, really fantastic to hear the details, you know, behind how OMB is meeting its human rights due diligence responsibilities and the path that you're on. So thank you, everybody. Apologies again for the technical glitches we've experienced today. Hopefully, though, um, we were able to, I think, get over those and, and learn quite a bit. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, this recording will be made available, and uh, we'll notify you um, when, when that is available so you can share it with uh, colleagues and others who may be interested. Um, and please do take a look at the 2023 benchmark results to get some more detail as well. Um, thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.